Welcome back to Quadruple D. That's right, D's Deep Diagnostic Dive. We're talking about bipolar and bipolar 2 with Meg Boberg. The Broken Brain. <laughs> This meeting is being recorded. So loud. <laughs> yeah, you can hear it on my side and your side. So, <laughs> As we were just saying off mic, um, I, I just thought I'd acknowledge it to the listeners out there, too, that my vision of uh, D's deep diagnostic dives, or quadruple D, as I'm calling it, um, <laughs> The, the vision behind it is to give a little insight into how we are diagnosed when we go to a professional and, and talk about our stuff. But I, I think it's a little dull just listening to me talk about it. So I'm trying to involve other people uh, in, these, in these discussions. So people can uh, let us know if this is more interesting to have other people. I think it is already. It, it already has been for me just setting up. Plus, I'm, I've am i also noticed that if I schedule it with someone, I'm more likely to do it. That's the other thing. <laughs> I'm like, for sure. I'm going to do one of these once a week. And then it's like, oh, yeah, no, I just have to motivate myself. No, <laughs> I got Meg waiting for me. And, you know, on the line, like, where is he? Oh, okay, I'll do it. I'm here. here Thank I am. You. So, <laughs> but I think it'll be fun. I, I thought of you because of some of the discussions we had when we were talking about ketamine episode about the diagnosis mm -hmm. and uh, it's something that we both uh, share in common also is we've had the same diagnoses correct um, of bipolar disorder so I'm excited to talk about it um, where should we start I've got the I've got my little I'm gonna hold it up to the microphone so people can see the color of the purple the purple Bible here the diagnostic and statistical manual hopefully the purple light radiates into the microphone and they can hear that. Um, it's important to mention it's part five or iteration number five, though, because they have removed and added new diagnoses since the original one came out, whenever that was, 50s, 60s, I don't know. Yeah, there's been a lot of weird iterations of it over the years. But the yeah, the DSM, although now they've replaced how they code the billing and stuff with another uh, source a lot of times, too. But for the diagnostic information, isn't it's fifth Iteration. It usually goes through a new number and then they put a text revision every few years or something like that when something happens. And often it's because there's something egregious that's, that we discover is egregious in there. Um, right. Yeah. <laughs> that's what it seems like. But Well, for example, homosexuality used to be listed as a mental disorder, which now we find most people would find quite appalling. <laughs> really, a little, a little problematic in the DSM yeah. history there. I think that might have even been in the three. Now, when I yeah. say when I say three, it sounds like it's two versions ago. But there's always, like I said, there's text revisions, which they would call like the three TR, the four TR. So it's actually probably more like three. Or oh, four another versions one ago. <laughs> another one that comes to mind is Asperger's syndrome used to be its own diagnosis, and now most people consider it just on the autism spectrum. Yeah, because. Dr. Asperger had a problematic past <laughs> and that's, it's just autism is its own spectrum. It's not like, Oh, I have mild autism. Well, I guess I don't have autism. So let's not go into that, but no, it, it, it is that, but it is interesting. And yeah, we'll, we'll get uh, deeper into that really another time, I guess. But I think one of the things that was really interesting was how you mentioned like, Asperger's was being used as shorthand for like not very serious autism. And I still hear people say that. They're like, well, right. my kid doesn't really have autism. They have Asperger's. And it's like the diagnostic criteria was actually had didn't have anything to do with functionality. It mostly had to do with like when you developed language. That was one of the main differences. But everybody mm -hmm. started using it as this shorthand. And, and like you say, there's a, you know some historical stuff there that uh, they just decided to say everybody – no. And and it's weird how emotional it can be when you've gone your whole life with that conception and that title and a diagnosis and then all of a sudden to be told, hey, uh, now you're autistic. It's like, well, what we're really saying is you always have had this and we're qualifying better what we say about it. But it's yeah, like, and, yeah, but there's a different emotional to, feeling. Yeah, Bring it back to what we're talking about today, bipolar disorder, <laughs> what used to be called manic depression. <laughs> How do you like the term bipolar versus manic depressive? 
You know, I may be an outlier, but I think manic depression is more descriptive than bipolar disorder. Mm-hmm. But your mileage may vary. <laughs> <laughs> what do you like about it better? I don't have a big, strong poll w- Des- one way or the other, but I'm interested. Describes the kind of depression and bipolar makes it sound to me like you're half manic, half depressive, which is not the case at all. <laughs> kind of like a lot of words that have bi in them don't mean half this, half that. It's a little more complicated, a lot more complicated than that. <laughs> but, but they're treated that way, though. You're right. You're absolutely right. That's yeah, there's a lot of misconceptions, which is why I'm doing all these podcasts, because I like to, I'm not a clinician, but I like to correct misconceptions and yeah. stick yeah, it is. And it's interesting as they've changed names in order to better quantify what they're saying. Sometimes they actually confuse it um, sort of sort of as, as well. I think that uh, one of the things that's important in understanding bipolar disorder is understanding that it's talking about it, it's a uh, uh, cyclical as as is easy, easy for me to say the word a cyclical <laughs> a depressive and mood disorder where we do move back and forth. And I think you're right. Like the bipolar of it, it makes it sound very binary, doesn't it? To say that there's this manic or depressive and uh, there's actually mixed episodes and there's a lot of like room in between kind of things. So yeah, yeah that's a good point. I, I think one of the things that's important and actually people should know that when someone is trained how to diagnose us with bipolar disorder, They start out in the diagnostic manual with the definitions of episodes, a manic episode, a depressive episode, and the ever popular hypomanic episode. Those are that's the or the sweet spot, as some of us call it. No, I I shouldn't call it that. (laughs) Euthymia. I learned that word. It's uh, when you're, I guess, stable, euthymic. I like I like that word. I'm a word person as a professional writer. So I like just, that too. I don't hear people yeah. say that. Euthymic. I like it. Yeah. I don't know if it's a clinical term, but it's descriptive to me of what it feels like to be stable. Well, it is now. How would you, how would you break that down? You meaning uh, EU is in euphoric, right? Euthymic is, well, I'm on my laptop so I can pull up the definition. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's kind of we don't go through remission uh, per se, but here it is in sta- in simple terms, euthymia is the state of living without mood disturbances. It's commonly associated with bipolar disorder. While in a euthymic state, one typically experiences feelings of cheerfulness and tranquility and resiliency to stress. That's from Healthline, which I I love Healthline.com. So. If you ever have a health related question of any kind, Google it <laughs> <laughs> and check it on Healthline. It's good to have a good resource for sure. <laughs> Let's uh, look at these definitions to say when we're not euthymic. I'm going to use that now, by the way. That's <laughs> that's definitely something that's going to make a multiple appearances, probably. And when I talk to people the rest of today. I'll be like, you know, euthymic. You ever think about this? <laughs> It'll be stuck in my head for, for, for the rest of the week for sure. You're so welcome. If we look at this, uh, I'll cite you. By the way, I'll just be like, oh, <laughs> Meg Bower. What? Who? <laughs> um, so look at the definition, or I'm going to look at the definition and let's see what we think of it. I like to, I like to look and say, does it seem like it feels like what we experience? Because surprisingly. Uh, not surprisingly, the diagnostic criteria often does match what we experience, and surprisingly, sometimes it doesn't very well. So a manic episode is defined in parts. As with everything else, there's like bullet points that they have, and you have to meet a certain amount of them. But they say a manic episode is a distinct period of abnormally, persistently elevated, expansive, or irritable mood and abnormally, persistently increased goal-directed activity and energy, lasting at least a week present most of the day, nearly every day, or for any any duration if hospitalization is necessary. Um, So that's the first first criteria. Um, Mm -hmm. And then it gives a list of different things that that kind of break down the definition of what elevated means. 
and you have to have a certain amount of those that, that come in too. Let's see, they include an inflated self-esteem or grandiosity, decreased need for sleep, more talkative than usual, uh, flight of ideas or subjective experience while thoughts are racing, distractibility, increase in goal-directed activity, um, or psychomotor agitation, and excessive involvement in activities that have a high potential for painful consequences. So impulsive, reckless, right. self-destructive behaviors, right? Um, supposed to be severe enough to cause marked impairment in social or occupational functioning or to necessitate hospitalization. And it is not attributable to the physiological effects of a substance or some other medical, you know, problem or something else. In other words, they always throw that in there to where it's like it shouldn't just be when you're high or else it's not be- it's not a probably a mood disorder. Right. Um, so what do you what do you think? Uh, that is a definition of a manic episode. I have some. Well, I teeter between type one and type two, which we haven't discussed. Type one of bipolar disorder is full blown mania and depression. And type two is hypomania, which is like quote unquote mania light. (laughs) And um, I, my, my doctor diagnosed me as bipolar otherwise unspecified because I have been hospitalized but it wasn't really due to mania. It was hypomanic mixed episodes or dysphoric hypomania is the old term for a mixed episode. Since we've been talking about euphemisms and how words, (laughs) but, and I don't think mania is happy time necessarily. I mean, I may giggle more and like have flights of racing thoughts, but more often I'm very agitated and irritable Uh, make poor decisions and I do kind of work off my impulses so that is if I want instant gratification I will buy something expensive or go on a date with a moron from tinder you know (laughs) (laughs) to put it mildly so there there are definitely things where you make decisions on high stakes things that you shouldn't be doing when you're manic and it can be hard to recognize hypomania versus mania because they're people don't often they can't tell you're hypomanic because you are more productive which is one of the things i you know like about being hypomanic is i am more productive for some reason like i will go on cleaning binges of my place and i write faster but it's not always productive in terms of like the quality. So it's, I have a love hate relationship with mania. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I think a lot of us do. Cause I think that's why I say when I, I jokingly call it the sweet spot, there's that feeling of elevation that hasn't hit mania yet. And they have that term now when we look at it and say hypomania, it's the 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 problem with it is it makes it uh, it showcases that it's still not healthy, and <laughs> and I think sometimes right. especially if you tend towards depressive episodes like many of us do, we kind of look forward to that time where it's like I can get some stuff done, and yeah, that's the thing is I'm not happy when I'm manic necessarily. I just have more like things go faster in my head than they should and. I just am a mess in a different way. And usually I have mixed episodes where I'm still depressed and manic at the same time, which is hard for a person to grasp, especially when you think bipolar, two poles. So that's right. what you're supposed to be one or the yeah. other. And you yeah, know, no matter manic, how depressed. like it's like how many different ways do we have to find in our evolving society that the, that the letters B I don't mean either or well i mean they do i guess right if you're a word person bicycle means two tires but um but to say bi you know the non-binary is is the push that is for almost like a lot of different things that seem binary in a way right or not as binary like as gender. people say well like gender exactly like bisexuality as well yeah. so, I'm, I'm attracted to men half the time and women half the time it's all <laughs> Yeah, so I hope my partner's hoping that uh, today's one of those days. No, you know, exactly. It's not like that. 
And to say it's like an either or a lot of times is assigned to that. So when you say that, I find one of the things that can be very unempowering, if that's a word, disempowering, is when <laughs> people will say, no, you don't seem like you have that. And oh, God, I hate that. I hear it <laughs> a lot. Yeah. <laughs> you don't need pills. You're normal. And I'm like, first of all, what the hell is normal? <laughs> Secondly, if the pills are working, that's a good thing. And you wouldn't be able to tell. You've never seen me unmedicated. One of my uh, friends in the past mentioned that I probably didn't need pills because I was so stable. It's like, for one thing, I can hide my hypomania pretty easily. It's a myth that we crazy people don't know when we're crazy. <laughs> so I'm very secretive, private about my bad decision making behind the scenes. So it's hard for people to recognize sometimes that I am in the grips of a mood episode, bad mood episode. Yeah. It's very obvious when I'm depressed because I'll sleep 18 hours a day and laundry piles up and the whole apartment becomes a laundry basket. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's different when you're depressed versus manic clearly. Yeah. Yeah. I think that you're absolutely right. Nowhere in any criteria that's in here, does it say that people aren't aware, right. At, at some point of saying, but I think that the idea sometimes is that when we can hide things, people don't know. And then sometimes we can hide from ourselves, I think, too, occasionally. Yeah, denial well. is powerful. Yes, exactly. <laughs> what do they call it? One of those coping mechanisms, denial. Yeah. it's And it's sometimes it's something we hold tightly onto as a coping mechanism. It, the interesting right. thing with uh, mania and hypomania is that, as you put it there, it's a significant difference from a diagnostic perspective. Is somebody, you know, typically bipolar 2 is more depressive with lower mania or hypomania, but not really mania. Uh, and yeah. so that's where it becomes important for the clinician you're with to say, well, what's the difference? And the interesting thing is, if you took like one of those uh, plastic, like see-through overlay, now I'm going to show my age, in college, uh, a professor would wheel in a projector and lay. Oh yeah, I'm that old too, Dwight. <laughs> a plastic, Thanks. right? No, we're, we <laughs> put it down and and it would shine. You know, a reflection. You have a basically a, a a clear plastic page. It, you know, if we did that with the mania and hypomania descriptions in the DSM, uh, first of all, you'd have to copy it very closely because the, the hypomania one runs onto a second page. So you'd have to do – back then when they used those projectors, you'd have to literally make a copy and then cut and paste with scissors. Anyway, um, but that's just a little blast from the past for everybody. <laughs> if they get in a time machine and go back to when I went to college, then they'll need that skill. So the interesting thing, though, is if you overlaid them, they're almost the same. In fact – they have the same uh, seven. I hit seven things before when I said like inflated self-esteem, decreased need for sleep, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they're the same, the same seven that are in here. They should also not be attributed to drugs. They, I mean, they mention all the same things. The one difference um, really that I see is, uh, where is it? Is that under hypomanic, it says this episode is not severe enough to cause marked impairment in social or occupational functioning or to necessitate. That's why people can't always tell. Yeah. No, they can't always tell. Even your own freaking psychiatrist can't tell because, so like I said, you hide it, you're secretive, you seem more productive, you no. talk faster. <laughs> you know, it's it's sometimes easy to disguise hypomania as I have my shit together when you don't. <laughs> Absolutely. And that's, that's something that I think also makes it hard to differentiate though, too, is there is that word marked. I've talked before during these deep dives about the, the principle of maladaptivity. That's the main thing that makes something a disorder instead of just a, a trait or something, right? Is that how maladaptive is it? And, and they put that word in there to say, what is a marked impairment? That's, that's, there, that's where subjectivity creeps in a lot. And, exactly. and I think there's a lot of cultural uh, expectations that come around it. Like, is your clinician someone who is comfortable saying, hey, yeah, I think you're having marked impairment? Or can we talk about what is marked impairment? I'm going to imply that you might have more serious kind of symptoms. 
Or is it someone who's like, well, you know, you don't seem like you've ever done A, B, and C, <laughs> not literally A, B, and C in the DSM, but just kind of like, here's the things that I think of when I think of a bipolar. No, you know, you're bipolar too. And somehow that's kind of a conciliatory prize. Um, hopefully people aren't thinking that way, but but they do <laughs> sometimes. Oh, correct. Right? It's kind of like type one and type two diabetes. Type one you just got for bad luck when you were a kid and lasts forever, of course, but type two, Oh, you deserve it because you would make this life. <laughs> it's right, true. Right, people, yeah. people look at them differently, even if it's unfair, it's just how it is. There's stigma attached to that diagnosis. Yeah. Yeah. And I remember for me as a clinician and it was before I was diagnosed with, with bipolar, that bipolar two started becoming a thing that more people were talking about. And one of the ways that it cropped up was people were taking antidepressants and not having a real marked improvement, which is not necessary. We've talked a lot on the show about how sometimes antidepressants, you know, for some people just don't. But what they found was a weird dynamic where for some people an antidepressant would work some of the time, which when you think of a bipolar 2 diagnosis, which is lower lows, shallower man- mania, um, then what you're going to see is, well, that kind of makes sense because the depressive episode is what was diagnosed as major depressive disorder because they didn't pick up on the hypomania. And so then mm-hmm. it works some of the time better than others. The depression treatments will treat the depression, but the depression is only there some of the time. Uh, and that's where bipolar 2 became more and more obvious in a lot of cases. And that's where I saw a lot of people that I worked with would get their doctor would try a mood stabilizer if the antidepressants kept not working and that sometimes they responded very, very well to that. Um, And so it was talked about a lot. And so then I think it also then becomes when something's talked about a lot and people are excited about it, you are more likely to be diagnosed with it. (laughs) Right. (laughs) And it's not that it's going around. Everybody's, you know, it's a bad bipolar two season this year and the bipolar two uh, shot didn't work as well as we hoped. And so everybody, you know, has a bad case of bipolar too. You know, it's just more like our, and I don't, you know, it's not necessarily purposeful. I don't think it's purposeful at all, really. It's just that people's attention is on it. Um, right. To where maybe they, to me, that's the biggest case of, of, of misdiagnosis or of underestimating the seriousness of a condition is that word there, marked impairment versus not marked impairment. And do we actually talk right. to somebody and say, how... How marked is your impairment? That's a good question. <laughs> then the mania. It's a t-shirt. It's a t-shirt right there. How marked is your impairment? No. <laughs> yeah, you got a side hustle going there. Get your Etsy profile up. <laughs> I'll but put it in the mania. <laughs> mania has a spectrum, obviously. If there's hypomania and mania, and the far right of mania is psychosis, which hypomania does not get into that realm. And that is when you really don't know you're crazy <laughs> is uh, psychosis because, and not like you said, not drug induced, but organic brain chemistry induced psychosis. And then those people, unfortunately, can get diagnosed with schizophrenia when they're actually by severely bipolar type one. It's interesting. So that's my take on that. <laughs> that's absolutely right. That's that's the main di- uh, differential. The heaviest differential is that hypomania will never be accompanied by psychosis. Yeah, you're you're right on. And that's usually the best way I've ever heard that described is basically is just what you said. Right? Is that's when you don't know because but psychosis is a break from reality. Um, yeah, I forgive forgive me for using words like crazy and other ableist terms, but sometimes they just. Oh, I feel like I have a right to reclaim those slurs. <laughs> <laughs> I use it. And, you know, take this from someone who called their podcast The Broken Brain. There's a there's a thing behind that. I've talked about it on the show. But um, people are like, wait, what are you saying? Um, and no, I, I use those terms, too, in a reclamation kind of way. Um, I No, you know, there are some people I don't use the term crazy around because they don't like it. But I, f- I feel like most... My experience has been that it's our word to use. Um, <laughs> Make a podcast on that next. <laughs> yes. Oh, that's a good one. We're going to put on the list. But Do words matter? Words we use kind of thing. So, yeah, tweet. I mean, like insane is a legal term. It's not, a, nobody, nowhere in the DSM-5, I don't think, does that word appear. Yeah. And it's, 
I don't know the legal term, like what it, the definition is, but insane is not one we use. Lunatic, maybe like a couple centuries old, but we don't use those terms anymore or not so commonly. How many? Yeah, it's amazing how many insults were based off those kinds of things originally. But I find that the shorthand a lot of times for it when we say that is um, when we think of a break from reality, one of the really interesting things is when people say psychotic, when they use it sort of, you know, uh, in a laid back layman's term, psychotic just means crazy, wild, whatever. But in reality, uh, psychosis or, or, you know, breaking from reality, having a lack of understanding of reality, hallu- even hallucinations, delusional beliefs, those actually occur far more frequently with depression and anxiety and bipolar disorder than they do with schizophrenia or other psychotic disorders, which is what people usually think of. It's like, so if I have right. a psychotic break, what does that mean? Does it mean I have one of these serious psychotic disorders? It's actually more likely to be occurring during what we're talking about. Um, which, I mean, it kind of makes sense because there's a lot more people who have a mood disorder or who have bipolar than who have a uh, psychotic disorder as far as the statistics right. go. So. And you can have multiple flavors of diagnoses. You can have, well, what's an example? You can have autism and be bipolar or you can have bipolar and be borderline personality disorder. There's no limit to what you can have, really. If you believe in yourself. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, but but that's the other thing that people don't don't talk a lot about, too. One of the things that I have noticed, and uh, you know what? Let me, let me I'm going to I'm going to flip around here a little bit, too, while we're talking about it with with bipolar disorder. Let me jump into it with since you brought up the idea of like cross diagnoses or uh, comorbidity, I think is right. the term. We yes. look at it and say uh, ADHD. Most people with bipolar also test positive for symptoms of ADHD. They're very, very connected. A lot of people who have bipolar disorder were diagnosed or were thought to have ADHD when they were kids. Oh, and another one I wanted to bring up, another very common combo is bipolar disorder and substance abuse disorder are very common because people with bipolar tend to self-medicate. And it's just so common because we have such instability that we want to sort of steer ourselves back to a, a state of stability. And when you're not in the best mental space, you don't know how to self-medicate properly. And uh, alcohol is just going to make you more depressed. I don't know if you're on cocaine or something or meth or whatnot, you're going to be more manic. Is that it's a personal just, question? Were you addressing yeah. that to me? <laughs> no, general you. <laughs> This is where people get worried about medication sometimes. And I say, you know, you're going to medicate most likely. If you need medication, you're probably going to medicate one way or the other. So uh, investigating it with your doctor is a good way to do it because, as you just pointed out, there's there's a sort of old school wisdom in the addiction community that some people are self-medicating with drugs and alcohol in order to feel normal, right? And I think that applies a lot to those of us in this camp. To say an escape from pain. To, yeah. so escape, it, it's an attempt to escape from pain anyway. It often does not. It only magnifies your pain. It does not take it away. Yeah. Yeah. And I found that uh, when I worked in an outpatient substance abuse facility, we were actually cautioned to avoid diagnosing bipolar disorder for at least the few first, few, first few weeks of sobriety, uh, especially if someone had a stimulant. Uh, use disorder or or were addicted to, you know, methamphetamines or uh, Ritalin or Adderall or, you know, things like that. Um, alcohol abuse is also very common for the reasons you said. But the thing with stimulant abuse was it would mask or, or yeah, act like the symptoms of, of a manic episode. So if someone was using or abusing stimulants, then uh, it would seem like they were manic. And if that stayed... And, and remain around after they were, you know, clean for a little bit, then we go ahead and move forward on a, probably, a, you know, bipolar uh, versus if it went away, boy, they don't seem to be manic anymore. Well, maybe they were just, you know, high when that happened. So. Yeah, very, very fortunately for me, I don't have, uh, well, it's addicts rarely admit when they're addicts, but <laughs> I don't have 
a substance abuse problem, but I have dabbled in the world of self-medicating. It's, I think almost all bipolar people have at some point. Yeah. I, I find that, uh, going to that idea of what is and isn't, uh, super maladaptive is probably one of the things I'd encourage everybody to say, if you're being diagnosed with bipolar, I would talk to your diagnostician, uh, your doctor or your therapist or whatever about, you know, which one do you feel? Is it bipolar one? Is it bipolar two? Is it some form of mixed? And it's interesting when you say, you know, you, you kind of been, uh, back and forth on that. Cause my experience was when I was first diagnosed, it was written down as bipolar two, but then, uh, you know, I've looked since then and it says bipolar on some documents that when I've had prescriptions and things. So I don't know when it got changed, but <laughs> that's a weird thing. I look in my notes in for insurance and sometimes it still says MDD major depressive disorder Sometimes it says bipolar one, two, and NOS is the most common one I get, not otherwise specified. Yeah. I'm a weird, like, kind of flavor of bipolar is how I describe it. <laughs> well, and I think that, I don't know, how do you take that? Because when, when there is that difficulty in nailing something down, even though I get it from a clini- clinical, a clinical, that was how I pronounced that. Um, that's a new new term I'm I'm workshopping. Um, <laughs> even though I understand it from that uh, diagnostic training background and everything, it still leaves me feeling kind of like weird and ambivalent about how am I supposed to feel about my diagnosis if it's if it jumps around a bit. <laughs> you know, how does I that agree. Make me feel? I don't like being labeled per se though. There's one since we've been talking about words so much, I'm a word person. Do you say I have bipolar or I am bipolar? I say I am because I don't think it's an ableist thing. I am. It's just something that's part of me. But I also don't want to be defined as like list five adjectives about Meg. Oh, the first one is she's bipolar. <laughs> Come on. So I, I waffle with what do I prefer? But I say I am rather than I have most of the time. Yeah, if I'm in a, a, a euthymic state, huh, then I uh, would, you know, I wouldn't list bipolar in my top five characteristics. If I'm manic, then I would list it as four of the five. Um, no, but it, it, no, it's a really good point because I have been chided by my own prescriber because I'll say, well, you know, being bipolar, or I'm bipolar. I say that. I've also been trained not to say that in my job, right? And to tell people, hey, don't say that. Um, I don't dislike it, though. I know that the theory behind it is saying I have bipolar disorder because I wouldn't say I am, uh, you know, I am a cardiac, you know, patient or something. Well, I would right. say I am a cardiac patient. That would actually be appropriate. Yeah, I, am, it's, it's I wouldn't sounds... say I am a heart attack, I guess, is the idea behind it. It sounds kind of strange to just, Say I am a diabetic. You say I have diabetes. I don't know. <laughs> right, exactly. But because you do, right? You do hear people say I'm diabetic, right? And you people or right. you hear them say I have diabetes. I have said both. I find that if I'm in a professional environment, I tend to say I have bipolar disorder. Um, probably people have heard me say it both ways on the show when I talk about it. Um, but if I'm just kinda can- talking about it, I'm like, yeah, I'm bipolar. <laughs> me too. Yeah, you, know. <laughs> you have to tread lightly sometimes, but you know what? I am kind of blunt, and I'm, I just say I am bipolar, not I have. I mean, I use both, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I think uh, to me it goes back to the idea of what does it represent? Because if mm-hmm. I say to myself, if I'm saying it and hearing myself say I'm bipolar, and internally that is triggering some kind of shame then I think that's probably bad. If I am saying I have bipolar and it makes me feel better, then that's probably good uh, or makes me feel less ashamed and particularly not just better. But at the same time, I, I also think that sometimes, and this is something that comes up when we're doing these these deep diagnostic discussions, not everybody falls into the same category. And that's mm-hmm. invariably a problem with any... any uh, uh, one size fits many type of description or feedback or advice. 
You know, that's where I think we have to look inside ourselves and say, well, how does it make me feel? If I say, right. do I have a, some kind of subconscious shame that's triggered or do I not? And some of us don't, you know? I mean, well, it's kind of like, do you tell your boss you're bipolar? I mean, my boss knows, but when I was talking to HR <laughs> at work, they're like, oh, your diagnosis is private, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, I, why do I have to hide it? Like be in the bipolar closet. Uh, when you Google my name, it shows that I'm bipolar. In fact, one guy who I met through a dating app is like, oh, you're bipolar unmatched. <laughs> so, when he Googled my name, when I told him my last name. So it, it does kind of, I'm, I'm a, like a weird sort of, I like seeing that it's on Google and I hate it because I don't want people to think that's her first characteristic. It's one of the things that is, is funny when you see people's reaction to it informally. I remember I had uh, one of my kids had friends over, well, this was a couple of years back. And it wasn't very long after I'd been diagnosed. And uh, one of the friends said to another friend, oh, what are you, bipolar? And then they kind of stopped and they looked at me real awkwardly in such a way that I knew <laughs> yeah. that my uh, my kid had told them that I had it. I mean, why else would they look at me that way? And I thought – and the things that went through my head were like I didn't take anything from it personally. I just kind of – like the first thing I had was a chuckle. was kind of like, oh, ha, ha, embarrassing for you. And um, – <laughs> The second thought I had was that, well, actually, I'm kind of glad that he feels like he can talk to his friends about it, right? Um, yeah. Uh, and that's a sort of level of sensitivity there to say, okay, are you joking about it in a way? But then to say, ooh, gee, I just said that maybe in front of someone. So, and then again, maybe I was hypomanic and I'm overinterpreting the whole thing and none of his friends know that I even exist, which is probably me most likely at all uh, <laughs> of all of them. But... Uh, so it's interesting the perspectives that you get, you know, from other people uh, when they're right. saying those things. Um, and sometimes that influences the way that we feel. One of the reasons that I, I like to talk about why we're diagnosed or how we are a lot of times is is because it helps us break that down, hopefully, to say this is how we're being viewed. I should uh, – I guess we should talk about a depressive episode. <laughs> That's It's kind of Go depressing. For it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm depressed ten times as often as I'm hypomanic. <laughs> no, that's why. Maybe that's where I'm. We're avoiding it. Um, a depressive episode has uh, nine criteria, and we have to have five or more of them present during the same two week period, which represents mm -hmm. a change from previous functioning. And at least one of them is either depressed mood or loss of interest or pleasure. So what they're saying, there's nine things, and then uh, the, the first two of them, you have to have one of the first two, and then you have to have five or more total over the same two-week period. You know, if we yeah, make this complicated have... enough, people really feel good about paying a person who's learned how to do it. Um, right. <laughs> like all medical, well, medical situations. Uh, so here's what they are. Depressed mood most of the day, almost every day. Mm -hmm. um, um, markedly diminished interest. In or markedly diminished pleasure in all or almost all activities, especially things that we usually do have uh, pleasure with. Uh, significant weight change uh, without having changed eating habits purposefully or without dieting or anything like that. So it could be either a decrease or an increase in appetite, decrease and increase in weight. Um, then let's go. The next one is insomnia or hypersomnia nearly every day. When I was doing the dive on major depressive disorder, it's interesting how either one of those changes, eating, weight, sleeping, either direction, a marked change without any kind of purposeful intention can be a sign of depression, which is kind of interesting. Um, uh, personally, I, you know, I had to learn that in school, that it could go either way, because I always just assumed people who were like, oh, I'm upset, I can't eat. I was like, I don't relate to that. So um, me personally, it's, if I'm depressed, I would eat. I eat everything. I don't know what you're talking about. What do you mean? Oh, I forgot to eat because I was so depressed. I now I've learned that that's a thing, but not for me. That's not the way I. Yeah, eat. never um, forget to eat yeah. <laughs> personally. Never forget. Now you can switch uh, from from hypersomnia because I've gone through periods of that to like insomnia, and in the same person, it can be the same kind of change or the or different direction right. of change, right? I've had both 
during yeah. depressive episodes and sometimes during the same depressive episode. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, it's kind of like you can't balance it because one day you sleep 18 hours and that's not an exaggeration and then you're so uh, groggy and whatever and then the next day you can't get to sleep because you are i don't know what you'd call it sleep logged <laughs> like water log, sleep log it's just sleeping is an interesting topic for bipolar when i sleep get try to go to sleep I have a whole ritual. I have to have some form of white noise or ambient music. I have to have my eyes gone as to be completely dark. And I just, I don't know. I even like have different ways the blankets are out. Like my one leg will be out. <laughs> I don't know. It's just, I have to really think, be mindful about how, about sleep. But sometimes I don't care and I just do what I want because I'm depressed and I just, you know, I get tired during the middle of the day. I take a two hour nap over lunch. And yeah, that's the thing is it's hard to be self-disciplined when you're depressed. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I think completely, I find that even more in some ways, the depressive episodes impact me more because I don't do things as much. Whereas when I'm hypermanic, I at least, and, and it's a self-perception thing too, because when I am on, and when I say manic, if we're on an effective uh, level of medication, the the manic is really is really muffled, generally speaking, to where mm-hmm. we're just on an up and a down mode. We're just being brought into a range that's a little more typical, hopefully. But um, I've noticed that my my downs can be sometimes more I don't know life consequencing in some ways uh, because they don't do things, sure. they can't do things. Um, I also have the really fun uh, vibe of having irritability on both sides. If so, if I'm a little too up, I'm irritable. If I'm a little too down, I'm also irritable. Oh, same. Maybe Definitely. I'm just an ass. Um, maybe I <laughs> I'm just more <laughs> markedly irritable when I'm up. And when I'm down, I'm like, you know, I, I want to be invited to your party. Not that I was going to go in the first place, but I want to be invited. <laughs> but... <laughs> It's that kind of bratty attitude, you know? Yeah. I am with you there for sure. Um, one of the things, oh, I guess I stopped here in the middle. So basically it would be eating and sleeping. Any kind of change that is non-typical uh, is a possible sign of, of depression. Um, uh, psychomotor agitation nearly every day observable by others, uh, not merely subjective feelings of restlessness. So it should be something that is pronounced. Fatigue or loss of energy. Almost every day, feelings of worthlessness or excessive or inappropriate guilt, which may even be delusional uh, nearly every day. Diminished ability to think or concentrate or focus. Uh, recurrent thoughts of death could be recurrent suicidal ide- uh, ideation. Excuse me. Even a suicide attempt uh, would be uh, definitely meet that criteria, obviously. Um, mm-hmm. And then, of course, uh, so those are the things that we went through, the criteria and if you have five or more of them, and one of them is the first two, then uh, the other criteria that they list is if you if you if you meet that point, you move on to the next level uh, of, of this particular video game, uh, where <laughs> the symptoms have to cause uh, clinically significant distress or impairment in your social, occupational, or other important areas of functioning, and. Finally, it should not be attributable to drug use. So that's like I said, and everything. Um, and so, you know, I don't know. The, that definition strikes me as, once again, there's a lot of personal interpretation. And I think that anybody who is going to be diagnosing ya, y'all out there should be hopefully having a discussion about, like, some of the subjectivity of that, right? Because if I'm sleeping a lot, how do I know if that's like, oh, that's a normal, you know, this is how much I usually do uh, mm-hmm. versus, uh, you know, how does the how does the person diagnosing me, I should say, know that unless I can chime in on that a little bit to say that it's changed. That's a simple, that's a pretty simple uh, example, but there's more nuanced examples of that, I'm sure. The thing is, when I'm depressed, I... I don't come in and to my psychiatrist or therapist appointment and be like, I am depressed. It's <laughs> my clinician has to read between the lines and hear what I'm saying in order to come to that conclusion. And I could just say, 
hey, I'm depressed, but I don't. I mean, not because I'm ashamed of it. It's just not like, it's not the light bulb doesn't go off depression. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it is what it is. Now, if there was like a blood test, and the thing is, is that they're trying that. Researchers are trying to get to some point where there would be like, uh, oh, we'll take a, a you know sample of your blood, and we, oh yeah, you have uh, and a scan of your brain, and it's like, oh, you have bipolar disorder, and it's like, oh, okay, well, let's go this direction. Yeah, that's in its infancy, though. I yeah, did exactly. About that on the NAMI website, NAMI stands for National Alliance on Mental Illness, and I was like, wait, really? I never had a blood test or. <laughs> brain scan, but I know that brain scans like MRIs can show areas of your brain that control mood and it'll show one is, you know, red and one's blue and one's yellow. And I don't know what they'll mean, but it's, it's just something that's interesting that could come up in the future. It is. With- it's fascinating to see. I think one of the things that's hard for people who don't read up on this stuff a lot is to realize that uh, when something is discovered, it's not immediately useful. Um, I just ta- I just interviewed somebody the other day who has done some studies with vitamin D deficiency and opioid addiction and some of the relationships there. And there's a lot that they've learned about that. But but he said one of the challenging things is they do studies with mice. And, you know, in a case like that, where if you address your vitamin D deficiency and you see if it helps with your addiction, there's not like a lot of risk there. Right. But he said just because it works with a group of mice doesn't mean, oh, yeah, tomorrow we can turn around and just everybody take vitamin D and there's no more addiction. Um, So it's the same thing where people read and say, oh, a brain scan shows this. Well, great. Let's see if my brain does that. It's like, well. We don't know why, widely enough to put it out there and have it actually work yet. But but hopefully they will get to a point where they can recognize, because at a certain level, there really is no difference between mental illness and physical illness, because mental illness is physical illness. <laughs> you know, and the brain is contained inside the body. Um, <laughs> and so it is observable if we can figure out how to observe it, right? <laughs> Correct. And there is no, well... To some degree, but we are striving for mental, physical health parity. I believe that was some legislation that, you know, it costs a fortune to treat mental illness. Even though you get reimbursed a certain amount, it's a chronic illness, chronic meaning ongoing slash lifelong, and you're never going to get rid of it. That's the depressing reality is it's always going to be there. Yeah. Yeah, and that's something that I think is still a difference that we see where we treat that differently than, say, other lifelong conditions. We mentioned diabetes. I mentioned that a lot as an example to say, you know, um, where do we, you know, where do we place that as far as our own reaction to those that have it? Do we say, oh, you have this uh, diagnosis, huh? You know, does that mean you're gonna be hard to deal with? We don't necessarily do that to someone with, uh, say, like type one diabetes. Oh, you have type one diabetes, huh? So you're going to make me want to, you know, plan they do ask um, some job applications ask if you're a smoker because smokers get sick more often, I guess, or there's a correlation. So they, they don't want to insure you if you're going to be smoking and getting all these illnesses from as a result of it. I've noticed, too, the, the interesting thing about questions like that for me it was like when I've, uh, uh, you know, see the same thing with apartment complexes and things of like, oh, you know, it's non-smoking here. Everybody knows that when they're asked a question that will get them in trouble if they say yes, they know people are usually smart to figure out, no. <laughs> yeah. But, 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 but we, we encourage that though, right? We encourage the, the omission or deception of those kinds of things sometimes by how we react. I'm not coming out pro smoking, by the way. That I just don't at me, everybody out there. That's not what I was saying. <laughs> like, um, but it is hard. It is hard when we're asked a question that we know. Boy, my whole approach towards you as your friend, employer, you know, partner, potential friend, whatever, is going to change depending on how you answer this question. It's like, oof, that's an intimidating question, you know? Right. So if we have this, if we're uh, fortunate enough to have all the criteria for <laughs> this, what what makes it uh, bipolar? Well, uh, there's really two things once you get down to it. Once you define manic, hypomanic, depressive episodes, there's really, they have an A and a B, basically, under bipolar. One, 
the criteria has been met for at least one manic episode. And the occurrence of the manic and depre- major depressive episode are not better explained by a psychotic disorder, schizophrenia, or other, uh, other disorders that you know, also seem to exist. So for, for bipolar 1, if you basically, if you have had a diagnosis of bipolar and it doesn't have a 2 attached to it, or if it says bipolar 1 somewhere on your doctor's notes, then you have had at least one manic episode most likely, or at least that's, what they, that's how they categorized you. And then uh, for bipolar 2, it's they have a couple others. They have an A, B, C, and D, which is criteria is met for one hypomanic episode and at least one major depressive episode. And criteria B, there has never been a manic episode. So the presence of one manic episode, which once again goes back to how marked is your impairment, our new T-shirt available on a Teespring shop. <laughs> Um, no, how marked is the impairment makes a makes mainly the difference, right? As far as which one you're going to be assigned. If you've had one manic episode that is a truly manic episode, you have uh, bipolar one, as it turns out. Right. The other two criteria in bipolar two are it's not attributable to something else. It's the same old thing. So right. that's the C and the D. So, I mean, so it's really interesting to say how much are we talking about it? And those out there that have been diagnosed, like how much did you get into the difference between how marked was your impairment? Because sometimes uh, sometimes that can also be totally subjective because if I, in a hypomanic or manic state, and we're trying to figure out which one it is, if I did a thing, you know, let's say I crossed the street and I... Uh, sprayed somebody with a squirt gun. Um, now, that's a dumb thing I just made up. If I did that and I am horrified, then that probably meant something to me differently than if I'm just like, ah, it's kind of normal, right? Um, so there's a little bit of determined now, and how did the other person feel? Now, what I didn't tell you is this person's related to the Wicked Witch of the West and the Wizard of Oz, and they melted and died because <laughs> I did that. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> So I'm I'm uh, obscuring whatever point I was trying to make. I feel like I now don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, no, just that there's subjectivity. <laughs> for one person, uh, you know, for one person, flipping someone off in traffic might be a major interaction that they had to be very angry to do. And for others of us, it was on the way over here this morning or whatever. Um, I didn't actually do that this morning. So road rage. <laughs> Right. And so how much uh, is the diagnoser listening to the person about, well, let's say that I did something more serious than those two things I just said. Is it something that the diagnoser says, oh, okay, yeah, that happens, though, and that's not super unusual. And for me, it's like, but it is super unusual in my life, maybe, right? Um, And then so am I going to be given a diagnosis that is, you know, maybe not going to be given the right level of attention over over or under reaction to the sort of seriousness of my condition? Strange, because I've been diagnosed with major depressive disorder for about 10 years and only the past five has it been bipolar. And apparently that's common to to have that story. (laughs) And it was. It should have been, I think, noticed earlier because when I was put on only an antidepressant at the beginning, I lost my mind. <laughs> I didn't sleep for a week except for little micro sleeps. And I was just talking so fast. And I get this thing called hypergraphia where you start writing just, and it's not coherent or intelligible necessarily. It's just like I have... I have so many thoughts in my head. I have to put them down. And I am pride myself on my proper spelling, punctuation, grammar, and syntax. And then when I get this hypergraphia, that all goes out the window. <laughs> so, uh, do, you, do you notice it at the time as you're writing? Or does it feel like? Yeah, it's I know it's good? nonsensical. It's mm-hmm. just I had to get those thoughts out. And I can't necessarily call my friends because I don't want to burden them with that. <laughs> the labor of getting me off the ledge. So... I have the this this one's fun because I don't oh, I've gotten better now but I I don't typically recognize this one while it's happening. I will get a bunch of ideas and I'm like a creative person and so when I get ideas I get excited. And it's like, "Oh, you know, so if I'm in a hypomanic state or or wherever, I have to be careful that I don't start two new podcasts." 
right? Um, that I don't get to a point where I've started something. But but here's the part I don't realize. Like I don't realize that I'm overdoing it sometimes. But also, I don't realize that I'm underdoing it. In other words, I'll get an idea that's like, actually, this is a really good idea. I'm going to, you know, do this kind of uh, approach in my business and I'll reach out for these kind of, uh, you know, customers or clients. And it's actually a really good idea. And I'll maybe sh- workshop it with people and they'll say, that's a really good idea. And then a couple of weeks later, a month later, I'll be like, man, I wish that idea would have panned out. You know, I guess it just wasn't a great idea. And, and then I'll look back and if I'm, and if I'm not in that mode, I'll go, I never really did anything with it. Like maybe I talked about it. I wrote it down. Maybe I printed up a flyer, sent the flyer to one person and then forgot about it for four weeks and then just felt like it was a failed attempt. It's like, well, I didn't all, I didn't, up, I didn't follow through with the attempt. I just thought I did. <laughs> you brought up a good point is when you're manic, you tend to start projects and never finish them. And it's because of the flight of ideas. You're like, Oh, I'm brilliant. I'm really feeling this, you know, but <laughs> you don't follow through with them. And sometimes they're a little too lofty. Like I was going to make my own website once. And I was like, I don't know shit about coding. So it did not pan out. Although I did buy the domain megbobert.com, which was kind of cool because okay. now it. <laughs> so, now, no, you listeners out there example. can't get it and try to sell it back to her like a bunch of dirt bags. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Court and Parts Podcast Network. To listen to more Cortem Bart shows, visit cortemparts.com.